I want to take a moment to acknowledge a member of the Journal Club Exec team. This week is Akshar. Um, Woo, Akshar! For all the work you do leading and managing the team. Akshar rocks. Yes, Akshar rocks. Um, the team is mentored by Dr. Paul Hauser and Luke Dean. There are three leaders. Akshar handles the training of people on our team. Anya handles the training of presenters. And I curate our talks and handle Science Thursday itself. This is how our meeting today is going to run. Today, Robert Sapolsky is going to present for about 20 minutes. There will be time for questions mid presentations. Please type your questions into the chat as you have them. The simpler, the better. We will organize them, either call on you or ask the questions for you if you prefer. Um, we are recording this presentation to be shared via YouTube, so if you would not like to appear in the recording, please turn off your video and only private um, message questions. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat or private message Akshar. He is a question and answerer for today. During the presentation, we ask that you turn your cameras on and stay muted unless you're asked to clarify a question that's being, an that's, um, being answered. You can use the chat um, and Akshar will get back to you as soon as possible for the discussion after the talk today. Um, Akshar and Dee will be the moderators, um, so they will help manage the discussion. Um, but now, let's get, give it up for Robert. Thank you, everybody. Okay, well, thank you. Yes. As I enter this millennium's technology. Okay, so I, Luke assured me there's no themes to any of this other than science. So I thought I would cover a topic today that certainly uh, surprises a lot of people. Okay, so starting with a scenario, you are a female baboon and you have just given birth. Um, the way baboons do it is it's in the middle of the night, which is a great circadian thing to have evolved in terms of you're least likely to get done in by a predator uh, by doing that. And you come down the next morning, everyone comes down from the trees, it's dawn in the savannah, and you are there with your newborn and everybody is very interested in it. Um, if you were a high ranking female, nobody comes near you or messes with you and everyone instead just sits around and admires you and the baby and assures you how much the baby looks just like you and isn't it all wonderful and stuff. Um, if you're a middle ranking female, you don't have quite that power, but instead you're sitting there and other females want to get a good look at the baby and they'll come up and they'll groom you, pretending to actually be interested in grooming you while slowly leaning over trying to see the kid until you elbow them out of the way. However, if you are a low ranking female, you've got virtually no say in the matter and you come down out of the trees with your baby and anyone who's interested comes over and just grabs the kid from you as this male is doing here. And what do they do? They are curious about the kid. What are they curious about? What they all do, everyone who comes over and looks at a newborn, they all do the same exact thing, which is they pry the legs apart and take a good look down there to get the answer, is it a boy or is it a girl? And this is a basic primate response, this highly dichotomized sort of approach to gender and sex and sexual identity and all of that beginning with other primates. The first question everyone is asking is not like, is a kid healthy and are they gonna get piano lessons or some such thing? But what every baboon wants to know is, is it a boy or a girl? And what we see here is this reflects what is seemingly total dogma in biology, and which is like one of the most lock and step, lock and step, whatever the cliche is, one of the most determined sequences in all of biology. You get your chromosomal sex back when you- Isn't were that the Lisa nerve, that's the Lexi Okay, don't know what that was, what was but that? I don't know. Um, you get your chromosomal sex when you were a single 
cell, a fertilized egg, and you get an X chromosome from your mom and you get either an X or a Y from your father and that determines your chromosomal sex. XX, you are destined to be female according to the textbooks, XY, destined to be male. Chromosomal sex, thanks to genes that are only found on the Y chromosome, um, chromosomal sex then determines whether this organ that's starting to grow in you, these two organs are gonna turn into ovaries or testes. So chromosomal sex determines gonadal sex. Your gonadal sex then determines what hormones you're secreting, estrogen, progesterone from your ovaries, testosterone from your testes. So chromosomal to gonadal to endocrine sex at this point. Once that is determined, those hormones will influence all sorts of primary sexual characteristics in you, like whether you grow a vagina or a penis. And then finally, that also determines all the secondary sexual stuff, muscle mass, larynx, all sorts of things like that. We have this absolutely clear pathway from chromosomal sex is your destiny, stepwise from that. And what I want to tell you guys about is all the ways in which this is not the case all the ways in which there are variations that happen in every single one of these arrows here. Okay, first one, so much for our perfectly dichotomized world of every, every one is either XX or XY, there is a whole bunch of variants of chromosomes where you get two Y chromosomes with one X, you get two X's with one Y. If you have that, you have something called Klinefelter syndrome, which I once saw in a baboon. You get all these variants. Chromosomal sex comes in a whole lot more than just XX and XY. What that leads us to is you can have perfectly classic XX or XY chromosomes. And despite that, you don't get a classic dichotomy at the gonadal level. Everybody either winds up with ovaries or testes. This turns out not to be the case. There are a couple of disorders. The first one, 46XY disorder of sexual development or differentiation, where you get somebody who winds up with testes and a womb and fallopian tubes. And the classic, the first paper about this was some guy, some 70 year old guy who was already a grandfather who was going in for a hernia operation. And they opened him up and lo and behold, sitting there surprisingly were his fallopian tubes. You get this mixture of what gonads you have and what sort of other organs come off of them. Another one is called ovotesticular disorder. And despite being absolutely textbook XX or textbook XY, you wind up with gonads that are a mixture of ovarian cells and testicular cells. So that can happen. Next step, you can be absolutely clear and dichotomized at the chromosomal level and the gonadal level, and then all sorts of endocrine stuff can happen. One is called a disorder from a mutation in an enzyme 5 alpha reductase deficiency. And what you have is someone who is an XY male from the chromosomal standpoint, has testes, has testosterone, but the levels of testosterone are really way off. And what you get is at birth, something of a mixture on a continuum between a vagina and a penis or you can have testicular feminization syndrome where you get an outcome like that, where you don't have testosterone receptors and you are brought up phenotypically as female. Everyone thinks you're female and around age 13 or 14, you're getting kind of disturbed because you're not getting your periods yet and all of your friends have, and they take you to the doctor and they discover that you have testes way up in your stomach and you have testosterone levels like crazy in your bloodstream. And what you don't have are testosterone receptors. So we see here, you can get versions like that. Cool thing with the five alpha reductase deficiency. There's a variant of it, a very rare one that is found in an inbred population of people up in the mountains in the Dominican Republic. And that particular version takes the form where your testosterone levels are low enough at birth 
where even if you are chromosomally male, as we see here, you have a female phenotype. And then around puberty, your testosterone levels get high enough that you transition spontaneously from a female phenotype to a male. And so that's totally interesting, cool endocrinology. What's even more interesting is the anthropology of it, which is this inbred population there that carries this mutation at some frequency, whatever, they've adjusted to it. They've culturally accommodated this fact, you know, you hit puberty, sometimes you get acne, sometimes you get a penis, whatever, this is what happens. And this is a normal cultural accommodation in this population. Okay, so we've now seen all these ways in which this can occur, in which the absolute determination of dichotomized binary sex is not so clear with that. So the question becomes how frequent this occurs. So Luke gives you an assignment. You have a project, which is you go to Hillsdale Mall, and what you have to do is interview a whole bunch of people. And what you do is you do two things with them. First, you force them to take an IQ test, and then you have them drop their pants, and you inspect the clarity of their sexual genitalia. And what you're going to discover is statistically a larger percentage of the population is born with sexually ambiguous genitalia than you find people with IQs over 140. You walk down the Hillsdale Mall and somebody there is more likely to have been born one to 2% of the population than you would find people with IQs over 140 which tells you something, this is not incredibly rare. We do not consider an IQ over 140 to be some like totally anom anomalous rare trait, nor is this, this is part of human variability. Okay, so we take things one step further now, which is where things get very interesting, which is you've got absolutely clear cut, chromosomal sex, you've got XX or XY, no ambiguity at all, no ambiguity at the gonadal level, at the endocrine level, at the genital level, secondary, and then we come to the brain. And then we come to the world of people who, at least by uh, any standards, have brains that are utterly different than we would have expected. If you are female and you have given birth to a son, as a result, you have neurons in your brain that are derived from your son. You have neurons that are XY. Where'd that come from? During fetal life, some of your son's stem cells got into your circulation, got into organs throughout your body, where in the ones that got into your brain differentiated into neurons, you've got XY neurons with your son's genome in your brain, maybe one thousandth of 1% nonetheless. If you are male, you got some of mom's stem cells in your circulation when you were fetus and some of those got into your brain and you've got some neurons that are XX in there. Your brain is a chromosomal mosaic. So this brings us to now the much more interesting issue in some ways, which is what to make up of the world of people who simply do not feel like their sex is the one the world has assigned them that their sex is the one that their chromosomes and gonads and over and hormones, et cetera, have assigned them. The world of individuals who feel sexually dis... Oh, I'm forgetting what the term is. People who in our world now are known as transgender. So the question becomes what to do with the standard medical interpretation of being transgender, which is you have someone who for some reason thinks they are a sex different from what they actually are. And it turns out something very different is going on. Okay, you look in the brain and there's all sorts of parts of the brain that are sexually dimorphic, which means that on the average, some trait about that part of the brain differs between males and females. And that's in lab rats and in non-human primates and humans. And you know, on the average, individual differences overlap, but nonetheless, all sorts of stuff in the brain is sexually dimorphic. And just a listing there of some of these, and you know, people spend their entire lives studying sexual dimorphism of some of these parts of the brain. So you take somebody now who chromosomally is sex A, 
and gonadally is sex A and hormonally and secondary sexual characteristics and genitalia is sex A. And nonetheless, they insist from as long as they could remember, they felt like they were sex B. And you look in their brain and what a bunch of studies have shown now is all the sexually dimorphic parts of the brain and that person's brain is more like what you see in sex B rather than in sex A. And this is independent of if they are actually transitioning to the other sex, if they've taken any sex hormone manipulations, whatever, independent of that, when you look at somebody whose every bit of their body says they are sex A, and they say, I have always felt like I am sex B, you look in the brain and the brain says sex B. So what we've got here, just finishing up with this is, all of these dimorphic brain regions can say something absolutely different from what your chromosomes, gonads, hormones, et cetera, tell you. It is not understood yet where this mismatch comes from, but what we saw in all those other slides there is you get mismatches every step along the way. There is nothing resembling sexual sort of binary destiny there. And what we're left with at the end is the medical dogma back when, weird, some people think there is sex different from what they actually are. What the neurobiology tells us is instead, some people now and then just have the crappy luck of getting stuck with bodies that are a different sex than what they actually are. Because as a neurobiologist, if I had to vote which voice counts more, what your brain is telling you or what every other part of your body is telling you, I would vote brain as do these people. Every now and then something happens and somebody gets stuck with a body that's a different sex than what their brain says they are. And this is kind of fascinating. And incidences of, of these are found in every other primate looked at and all of this. And this is not weirdo biology. This is yet another realm in which biology comes on a continuum. Sexual identity, sexual orientation, speciation. There is no dinosaur on earth who ever gave birth to a bird. Instead, it's intermediate. Everything's on biological continua. And this is one of the like coolest, most unexpected realms of it. Okay, so why don't I stop here and see if there's any questions. Uh, there was one question earlier, um, which was asking for a review of how exactly kind of chromosomal discrepancy might arise between the nerve and the muscle body. Um, in terms of getting something other than the classic XXXY, or the step from chromosomal to gonadal? The former one. Um, the former. I think what you get is rare cases where two sperm uh, can both fertilize the same egg at the same time. So if you wind up with three sex chromosomes and whether you are XXX or XXY or XYY depends on what the two sperm were. I think that's the most frequent cause of that. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant the one about the neurons. I oh, the neurons. <laughs> How you get that at the level of the brain at the end? Let me see if I can stop sharing. Yes. Okay. About at the level of uh, the brain differentiation, nobody knows. Nobody knows the model used to be that if you got exposed to testosterone when you were in your testes, you got a male brain. And otherwise, you had the default model of a female brain. And that was shown to be completely false after a couple of decades of people learning that you get active sexual differentiation um, in both sexes there. And what you've got is, you know, Every now and then ovaries make some testosterone. Every now and then testes make some estrogen. You do not get clean binary dichotomies like that. And you wind up with a brain that is not cleanly binary in that sense either. Another common question I'm seeing in the chat is about kind of what like phenotypically what these differences in the brain might actually uh, what characteristics are changing and, and fundamentally what kind of the differences are in the brain between the sexes. 
Yeah, great question. Um, no surprise, this has generated a lot of controversies. There's one version of this. So what is the disease called? I'm forgetting what it's called. Um, I should know this. But in any case, it's one of these where um, you wind up with a female phenotype um, amid a lot of testosterone exposure in the brain. And in the 1950s, everyone was totally excited when this was discovered to see, so what's the behavior of these girls like as they're growing up? And all sorts of studies were done. This group of Johns Hopkins pioneered it. And within a decade or so, they had the answer, which was these girls grew up with all sorts of abnormal behaviors. And then you looked at what counted as abnormal behaviors in 1950s textbooks of endocrinology. They were less interested in dolls than girls are supposed to be. They said they were less interested in getting married someday. They were more interested in careers. At some point, all the endocrinologists said, uh-oh, I guess that was kind of stupid questions to ask. That's not really what we're trying to understand here. So they had to go back and do the studies all over again. And what they find now, modern versions of it, someone named, what is her name, Hines at Cambridge, is sort of the king of that. Um, and what she's showing is, on the average, girls with this syndrome have higher levels of aggression, higher levels of reactive aggression to provocation than boys do. And as adults, this is what you see. Whoa, okay, so we've just discovered something about testosterone and the brain pushes you inevitably in that direction. Two things though, problems with that in terms of the behavior. The first one is saying on the average, there's lots of overlap between the two, there's variability, blah, blah. The other is the biggest problem that does in this entire field of study, which is you were not simply born with a brain that had some of those things happening, but as we saw in all of those, you've got sexually ambiguous genitalia. You got born and from birth, everybody was kind of interested in what was going on in your crotch there. And you had three or four rounds of reconstructive surgery when you were a kid and <coughs> everyone, <coughs> didn't quite talk about it, but you, you get raised differently. And what you see is, thanks. There's absolutely no way to differentiate the biology of what's going on in these disorders <coughs> and the effects on the brain from how you were raised because of having been born this way and all the ways in which this is a challenge to society as to how to deal with you now. So there's absolutely no answers as to how these different phenotypic profiles wind up looking like behaviorally. Nobody knows because you can't control for that one factor. And somewhere in there, when you're looking at the one to 2% incidence of these, you have to ask a much more fundamental question, are words like disorders, medicalized, pathologized terms even appropriate? If less than that percent of the population has IQs over 140, those are not disorders. That's a normal range of human variability. Is it in fact wrong to have sort of medicalized these into terms, medical terms in the first place? Okay, more questions? Akshar, I'm gonna jump in real quick. Um, Hey, Robert, I think some people are a little bit confused between uh, like physiological exposure to hormones and um, the genotypic differences in sexes. So I think maybe just clarifying what it, the difference is between a cell that would be in an XY brain that is XX versus a cell that is in a brain that is exposed to testosterone versus estrogen at higher levels. Great. Okay. So everything's sorted out in terms of what gonads you have and what hormones, what sex hormones you're secreting. And then the sex hormones have effects all throughout the body. And they regulate gene expression, they're steroid hormones, that's how they work. And the first thing that you see is their effects vary throughout the body depending on how many receptors there are in each particular tissue for that type of hormone. 
So you get variability at how sexually differentiated different tissues in your body are. And then there's differences and enzymatic stuff downstream from the receptors, all of that. And by the time you get to the brain, the exact same thing, different parts of the brain are differentially differentiated sexually or differentially sensitive to these hormones. So you then get there and, you know, you get, for example, in a part of the brain called the amygdala, which has a lot to do with fear and aggression. And the amygdala has lots of receptors for testosterone and lots of receptors for estrogen. And what you see is, depending on how much of each hormone is getting in there, you get completely different profiles of gene, gene transcription in amygdaloid neurons. And thus you get different functions of it and different thresholds for things. And nobody understands entirely how you get from that to some of the phenotypic differences in things like fear and anxiety and things of that sort, but that's the level at which this stuff works. These hormones, steroid hormones like testosterone, estrogen, progesterone are like, um, you know, they have effects on gene transcription throughout the brain. All of this brings up this question that if you happen to wind up with somebody's brain sitting there on your breakfast table and you're slicing it open and can check it out, are these sexually dimorphic traits so dramatic that you could look at somebody's brain under a microscope and tell what sex they were? Are, I guess if the brain is out, what sex they were, um, let alone, can you tell what sex they say they had always felt like? Absolutely not. There's enormous variability. These are populational differences, statistical differences, blah, blah, all of that, enormous overlap. And it's not at that level. It's not that dramatic. And the differences are incredibly subtle. Cool. All back to you, Robert. You can move forward. Okay. Any other questions? There are a ton of other questions, um, but I want to make sure that you have time, if you want to, to either answer questions or to go on with your presentation. So it's up to you what you want to do. That was the end of the presentation. Which Perfect. Is, that's what's going on in the brain. <laughs> okay. Yes, that was the end of the presentation. Wes, do you want to ask your question out loud? I think you might need to clarify it just a little bit. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Hi, Dr. Spolsky. Um, my question was earlier in the presentation, you had mentioned that in cases where the chromosomes, the gonads, the hormones, et cetera, it, it, we have cases where all of these things point to sex A, uh, but the brain indicates sex B. And then I think you said, as a neurobiologist, you vote with the brain uh, for sex B. And I was wondering if you could uh, explain more about, about the, your criteria for that vote, I guess, for lack of a better. Oh, I don't know, because the brain is the best organ in the body. It's, <laughs> it's wonderful and it's, it's more complicated. And because our sense of who we are has far more to do with what's going on with our brain than, you know, anatomical features of our bodies, let alone what society thinks of the anatomical features of our bodies. I don't know, I'm a neurobiologist. They'd take my license away if I didn't think the brain was the most important part. Um, and I think what you see is, as another way of saying why the brain is most important, if you are someone who is transgendered, um, this is a source of tremendous distress in your life until that is resolved, if you're lucky enough. You are subject to incredibly high rates of hate crimes, things of that sort. If amid all the reasons why you should agree with whatever your like gonads are saying, but nonetheless, you are saying, no, this is who I am. In some ways, that's the best measure of the primacy of the brain in that. You have every reason to decide to go with all the other measures, given how society treats you. Um, and yet, the brain wins out. Great, thank you. Akshar, you got any questions in the background that aren't getting answered? I don't see any, no. <clears throat> okay, um, I have one, which, sorry, I just gotta find it. Uh, okay, um, Robert, the question was back to the uh, 
neurons and XX versus XY neurons. I'm just going to read it to you. Um, hey, can you ask the question, how could a male brain have a copy of their mother's XX neurons? Is this due to a genetic mutation? No, it's totally weird. It's because the picture is one of during fetal life, maternal circulation goes into the fetal circulation and that's the direction it goes. It actually fluxes back and forth. So the mother can get stuff in her bloodstream from the fetus, the fetus from the mother, even though it's mostly from mother to fetus. And some of the things that can go both ways are stem cells. So you are a male fetus and among other things, some stem cells from your mother have gotten into your circulation and get into your body where being stem cells, they start to differentiate and wind up in organs throughout your body. And what you've got then is every organ in your body, even if you are a like boring textbook XY male, you are gonna have some cells in there, a fraction of 1% that are not only XX, but have your mother's genome. And of course, given that that winds up in the brain as well, I think that's like the most interesting thing. And if you're female, while you're pregnant, some stem cells from your fetus are going to get into your circulation and get into your body. And thus you are gonna have cells in your body from your daughter that are XX, just like your cells, but have her genome. Or if it's a son, you are gonna have some cells, including neurons that are XY with your son's genome totally weird what are the implications of this nobody has a clue at this stage this is just like a g whiz finding isn't this like totally bizarre and strange um like nobody knows what this means yet but it's just a very cool okay i might butcher this question and i think it's a good one um so the person that asked it, if you want to private chat me, uh, if I don't ask it cro correct, correctly. But I think the question is essentially, um, is there any ability to predict uh, the ending phenotype in terms of belief about one's own gender? So is there some way to decipher from the brain, from whether it's genotype or anything that, that one would feel male, female, or in between? Um. Here's how I would do it. You take somebody, let's say just 10 years old, but if you could do this study on somebody who was a day old, that would work just as well. But put them in a brain scanner and you say to them, hey, you're male. And if all sorts of parts of the brain associated with anxiety and fear and distress and sadness and depression and all of that suddenly activate, you probably just found that out that that's actually differentiated as a female brain. And if you say to somebody who's female in a brain scanner, hey, you're female, and you get the exact same sort of adverse, that's probably a good sign that that is a brain that is being made very unhappy and very uncomfortable by the sex designation that you just gave to that individual. Okay, so that's obviously like half sarcastic. <clears throat> That's sort of the extent of knowing it. I mean, the best way as a readout from the brain is if somebody is desperately unhappy and their life dramatically disrupted by the fact that they don't feel like they fit into their body in this regard, that's like the best way for the brain to tell you that. Is there a test? Is there a brain scan? Anything? Absolutely not. Again, because of the variability and because if you really want to understand the variability um, in these sexually dimorphic parts of the brain, you're going to have to take the person's brain out and slice it up and measure it with like a little tape measure. Um, all right, Vina, I'm going to try to ask this question. Um, so correct me if I get it wrong. But the question is essentially um, the circulating hormones in a person identifying as male, female, or perhaps transgender would be different. Um, what would the effect on the amygdala be of those different combinations of hormones? Well, I think what we see here is um, there does not have to be a specific hormonal profile uh, to somebody who winds up being transgender. It can be completely dissociated. It's stuff happening at the brain level, which tells you 
if there's something going on with receptors uh, that, that, uh, oh, androgen sensitivity syndrome. If there's something going on with receptors there, what that tells you is, yes, the amount of a hormone could be important. The amount of a neurotransmitter can be important, but the amount and nature of the receptor for it is at least as important. If somebody can't hear you, it doesn't matter how loud you were yelling, or if somebody is hearing you in a incorrect way or whatever, the receptorology is important as are the downstream steps. So it doesn't necessarily require anything out of the ordinary uh, in terms of hormonal profiles for someone to be transgendered or cisgendered. It can be completely independent of that, what we see. What those are doing in terms of makeup the, of the amygdala gene expression, what sort of synapses are formed, you know, all the usual complexities in the brain there are barely understood. Okay, and I'm going to follow up with this one. Um, you talked about the relationship. Nope, I'm getting a sign from Willow that is... I'm not yes, so if you're a student at Nueva in the upper school, you now have the all-hands meeting, which is required. Um, student myself, I think we will have to leave now. I think teachers and adults, I will hand the hosting thing over to Dee. Um, so you're welcome to stay if you have any questions. Thank you much, so much for joining us today. Please see any recordings from past presentations um, on our web website at project80.org. Thank you, everybody. You get a kick out of that? Yep. <laughs> Why don't you know when there's meetings? This is your school. You're supposed to be like plugged into this stuff. There's a, there's a lot of things I'm supposed to be, Robert, but uh, there's only so <laughs> many things that my brain allows me to be. And I can either focus on the students and the science we're doing or where I'm supposed to be at any given time. We can just ask your, your relatives who are on to sort of uh, expand on that. Um, yeah, I, I'm glad you touched on the, the idea of testosterone and uh, violence and perception of threat. I, I, as you know, like I'm super, yeah, I just find that one super interesting. Yeah. It's, uh, it's very interesting stuff. It's always very interesting seeing how completely unsettled a subset of uh, people are hearing about stuff like this. Um, yeah, binary brains is a misnomer. And this is also like just a really great basic biology example of how genotype does not always correlate to phenotype. And I think, you know, as I was thinking back on the, all the questions that are being asked, I think we're, we're kind of leaving students with that slightly problematic idea that genotype is predictive of, of behavior. Um, which of course then immediately gets you into all the evolutionary debates of whether the most interesting stuff is selection at the genotypic level or the phenotypic level. Right. You know, that one goes around forever. Um, but yeah, it's not lockstep. It's not guaranteed. Genotype is not destiny. Does anybody else have any questions here? Brock, I know you were asking a few in the chat. I want to make sure they get answered. I just took yeah. around to say thank you, Dr. Spolsky. This is this is a great talk. Really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah, you mentioned that um, that uh, the, the the child can have some genes from the mother. So it can have some cells that are the mother the mother's genes. Can does that also apply to the child's uh, gonads? And if that's the case, then does it apply that? the mother can grandmother can end up being genetically the mother of a child whoa yeah um i would say not the mother of the child but oh, um, I get it. source of maybe one out of a billion cells in the gonads i don't know if if the if the mosaicism from one generational jump is a fraction of one percent um, in theory, then it could be two generations, um, but it would be a fraction of 1% squared. So no, I guess my question is, could, could like the egg of the child have, have the genes of the mother? 
uh, I think I think I might be able to rephrase your question, Brock. In a way okay. So I think Brock's asking if you have a person who produces eggs, and that person has circulating cells from their mother. Is it possible that their mother actually in the gonads produces Whoa. the child's offspring? Yes, that is like unbelievably rare. It's like. I would guess more than one in seven billion sort of thing, but yeah, I guess in theory that could happen. Um, that would be very peculiar, and yeah. it would be and there'd be no way to know um, without genetic testing of, yeah. of all three generations. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, and hell, why not four generations? <laughs> to, like you're your mother was actually an Australopithecan or something. <laughs> uh, I think, so Robert, we're thinking about doing, we're, we're going to do a theme next year. Um, I think gender might be one of the better debates that are out there. What we're trying to figure out is to how, how not to present simply one side. I wonder if there are people who think and have evidence that um, that you know there is more of a genetic binary or there is more of a gender binary than we think? Yeah, my guess is I don't know. Find some ninety-year-old endocrinologist, and you're probably all set with that that viewpoint because they haven't learned anything new since their residency and. 1903 or something um, so you think i should in the call i should use all that specific like you must be 90 years old you must not have learned anything in between your residency and now right or you slept through every one of your <laughs> medical education seminars and they shouldn't have given you the certificate afterward all right lisa just said i bet there are under 90 year old proponents yeah we, we may have to like look at the endocrinology fundamentalist church Venn diagram interface for some of that. So I think what you're saying, the propensity at this point, the amount of data that suggests the non-binary idea just so completely overwhelms the non-binary idea, the binary idea. No. Um, it depends on how much you're digging in your heels and saying, I'd, I'd really like to see a few more replications before I'm convinced of that, or I'd really like to see a few more thousand replications before I'm convinced of that. You know, it's the, the culture of changing any scientific dogma. Um, the number of studies on like the classic uh, sexual dimorphism of the brain, depending on sexual orientation studies. It's, it's a total of maybe six or seven studies and they're incredibly difficult to do, but they all say the same thing. Um, but plenty of people still say, yeah, individual variability would like to see a much larger sample size. And these ones, there's maybe a seven or eight papers by now on sort of the transgender brain dimorphism stuff. And, you know, does that mean you believe it? I do. Um, these are really good labs and these are incredibly careful studies and well-controlled, blah, blah. But there's lots of people who are going to say, you know, not until, not until that's 20 years worth of replication. So yeah, there's a lot of resistance to it. But I, I think the findings are clear cut. I mean, every damn part of the brain that's been looked at that's sexually dimorphic in transgender individuals, on the average, that part of the brain looks more like the sex the person says they've always felt like, rather than what the sex every other bit of their biology is saying. So, so it's, it's pretty striking. You know, as you were speaking, I realized that there's just like a really interesting question about how, so a person that is in the wrong body, um, what like what is the mechanism by which they recognize the difference in the way they feel or the way they should be treated and how does that produce like a negative emotional state um 
Because you should know all the answers, by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's a huge, huge controversy going on right now. There's somebody at Brown. She's a pediatric endocrinologist who is suggesting that there's a whole subtype of transgendered individuals who don't begin to feel their sense of, of dissonance with their assigned sex until adolescence. And that's hugely controversial um, because the textbook transgender knowledge by now is the person saying, from as long as I could remember, this simply felt wrong. And you do studies, people look at like home videos, blinded observations of them trying to like identify things like future sexual orientation, future sexual identity in individuals when you're looking at videos of them when they were four years old and people can detect differences at above chance levels. I mean, the standard picture is just as long back as I could remember, this just felt wrong. This just didn't fit with who I am. And like whether like what version of a miserably unhappy life that increases your odds of having is presumably very idiosyncratic. Yeah, I'm just curious about what they're actually, you know, as you, as you said, it's, it's confusing, but what they're actually measuring in that when, when, you know, I don't feel like I'm supposed to, what is it, what is their own internal measure? You, what does it feel like right now? I'm thinking I'm left-handed and right now I'm thinking about what does it feel like that, how do I feel left-handed? And on some weird level, I feel like there's a shorter connection from my brain to my left hand than to my right hand. Like, what is that? What, is, yeah. what does it mean to feel, you know, having brain laterality? What does it mean, any of those? It's totally bizarre, but like, I can feel left-handed. And, sure. I, you know, with any of these. So the best evidence is from most cases, um, most instances, it's people feel their sexual identity from as long back as they could remember, whether they're cisgender or trans. Yeah, I got to do some more reading into this. I'm probably going to bother you soon about some authors. Yeah. Um, what's that book, Middlesex? Eugenides, what's his first name? I can look it up. Novel about somebody that way. And it's like your, your brain, your brain knows what the rest of your body may be clueless about. Yeah. 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 Jeffrey Eugenides. I'm like, I just saw it. Um, Thank you so much for talking today. I hope we didn't take too much time out of your day and I hope you enjoyed talking to the kids a little bit. Yeah, no, cool stuff as usual. Um, yay, Nueva students. Um, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't say uh, the odds are, what the odds are of walking around the halls of Nueva and finding somebody with an IQ of over 140, but. <laughs> I was thinking about making that point. Wall example. That, that may not be a fair sampling either, but. Yeah, I was afraid. I was afraid somebody was going to draw the conclusion that that meant that there was an equal number of people with gender, or confused gender, or transgender in there. So I didn't. I stayed away from that. One. Okay. Nice to see you guys. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Take care, guys. Be well. All right. Bye, Robert. Talk to you soon. Bye, Robert. Bye, Elliot. Bye, Luke. Bye. Bye, mom.